We are in a revolution. But it is a revolution in which the side that fires the first shot loses. We will not fire any shots because our weapon is uncommon good sense. Hello and welcome to Tractor Time. Tractor Time is brought to you by Acres USA, the voice of eco agriculture. I'm your host, Ben Trollinger, editor of Acres USA magazine. Before we get to our guests, I have a few questions. When you think about recycling, what do you see? Plastic containers piling up in the garage, maybe? The overflowing bin of clinking wine bottles that you're more than a little embarrassed by on pickup day? Or do you just see waste? out of mind once it's out of sight. Or do you see a farm? Today we're talking with Jerry Gillespie. When he thinks about recycling, he sees healthy soil and nutritious food. He sees communities coming together to claim the rightful value of what most of us think of as just trash. In his native Australia, Gillespie saw two big problems he wanted to fix. Farmland that had been degraded by years of chemical agriculture, and overstuffed landfills that were belching methane into the atmosphere. The answer to both problems would be to harness a largely untapped resource hiding in plain sight, the massive amounts of organic matter being discarded every day. We're talking about yard waste, cardboard, newspaper. We're talking about kitchen scraps, the potato peels, the coffee grounds, the eggshells. What if we could capture these nutrient-rich resources and funnel them into regenerative farming systems? An internationally recognized recycling expert, Jerry Gillespie wants to challenge our preconceptions about waste, and he's been doing this kind of work for decades. He's a pioneer in the zero waste movement and the mastermind behind the City to Soil Project, which connects household organic matter with farmers. He's the author of a new book from Acres USA called The Waste Between Our Ears, The Missing Ingredient to Disrupt Climate Change is in the Trash. I'm thrilled to have him on the podcast today, but before we get to Jerry, these words. Good day, dear listener. This is Ryan Slaybaugh, the general manager of Acres USA, and I'm the former host of this podcast. And I just wanted to say thank you for your continued support. We're almost to 100,000 downloads in our history, and that is no small feat. So if you've been listening for years and you've been wondering how to support us, there is a way to give back. We produce this podcast free of charge, and in order to continue doing so, we do need your support. Uh, Go to ecofarmingdaily.com slash donate. That's ecofarmingdaily.com slash donate and give any amount, uh, $1, $5, $1,000, and you will directly be supporting the idea of free education for farmers, growers, and people across the globe. Uh, the idea of free is not sustainable, so your gift, along with our sponsors and advertisers, help carry this message to new audiences and to you into the future. So that's ecofarmingdaily.com slash donate. Thank you again for listening and for your support, and have a great day ahead of you. Hey, it's Ben again. A note on the audio. Zoom is my primary tool for reaching out to my guests. As you may know, Zoom is in high demand during the COVID-19 pandemic. As a result, the audio quality, which is usually pretty decent, is a bit degraded here. You'll still be able to hear everything clearly, and I think you'll agree that Jerry is a visionary who has a lot to teach us about turning waste into a resource. And without further ado, here's my interview with Jerry Gillespie. Jerry, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Ben. For our listeners who may not be familiar with you and your work, which has taken you all over the world, walk us through your background. Basically, I worked for the ACT, the Australian Capital Territory, our national capital. I worked for their government for a while. I had prior to that, I had a very strong interest in earthworm production using the species of Senia fetida and general composting. But working for the government presented the opportunity to start getting more directly involved with community in at a fairly large scale. That basically involved conducting more sort of public consultation on the directions that people wanted to take with waste strategies generally and recycling. And about that time, there was a huge interest in the idea of recycling generally, which had progressively built up from the 1960s and 70s. And organics is also becoming more prevalent. I'd, got, I'd had a few speaking engagements in 1997. I went to the world's first zero waste event held at Monterey in California in 1997. I returned from there and I think I went to China for two weeks and then back home and then to New Zealand for two years as the founding manager of the Zero Waste New Zealand Trust. And since then, um, I've just been travelling a lot and my main focus in relation to that, and I suppose 
it grew stronger as I worked more and more with community was it struck me really solidly that, that people in community were not really aware of the fact of the importance of agriculture. We had this tool in terms of organic waste, but most of the time it was, yes, in some instances it was going into home gardens or even community gardens, and those people were doing excellent work. But I felt that as a, as a, in the bigger picture, it was a tool that we could use to reconnect people with the soil as their mother, I'm trying to get people to understand the notion that the importance of farming is, is phenomenal to any economy. Like in, in Australia, it's quite often said by our treasury officials that agriculture is, is only something like 15% or 12% of our economy, but oxygen's 20% of the air you breathe, you wouldn't want to do without it for too long. So it's, it's a very, very fundamentally important thing. And that just grew from there. I, I found myself um, travelling to community groups all around the world and also to, to important conferences talking on the subjects of either worm farming or, or organics, particularly compost processes. I have a, a website where I have all of the recipes for composts and inoculants that I use that people can get that information for free at jerrygillespie.net. So that's, that's a pretty comprehensive but very British sort of background, Ben. Well, I, I think the, the, the crucial thing for me is your, your ability to connect so-called waste with agriculture. Because I feel like so, for so many people, recycling has become kind of a hollow ritual. We're kind of atoning for our sins as consumers. It makes us feel a little bit better about our lifestyle, that we can take all those plastic bottles and containers and whatnot, put it in a little bin and feel slightly more satisfied about who we are. But really, you've been sort of challenging that paradigm for a long time and, and, and sort of redefining what we mean when we talk about waste. And so let's talk a little bit about language. What do we mean when we say waste? For example, the name of your new book is The Waste Between Our Ears. Explaining that title might help sort of answer the first question. I think the big thing with, with waste per se is that it's a mistake. It's a concept calling an empty Coke bottle waste simply because you've taken the Coca-Cola out of it is, is just neither here nor there in terms of the fundamentals of the material. So you, you don't change, say, um, a Monday by calling it a public holiday. It's exactly the same Monday that it was previously. But I think the importance of trying to get people to understand that probably the most valuable thing in their entire waste stream is the organic fraction. And the organic fraction, if you include paper and cardboard, is 60 to 70% of the totality of what we throw out. And, and also, too, as you said, there's, there's a lot of frustration with people where if you, if you recycle your aluminium or aluminium cans and your bottles, your plastic and your paper, they do see that people like the larger companies make a lot of money out of it and people like Rupert Murdoch make a lot of money out of you recycling your paper. But what does it do for local community? And, and that really comes back to very, very little. I think in terms of organics, so if you recycle your organic material, you can get phenomenal results out of it. But some of the work that's being done in America in recent years on quorum sensing and the output of auto inducers from secondary fermentation processes in compost indicate that we may have in composting the very tool needed for farmers to progressively move right away from chemical fertilizer. So the value in what we call waste streams is phenomenal. It, it cannot be a waste if it has that much value. We need to look at how we return that value to community in terms of the employment positions we can create, and the opportunities we can create in specific communities to use particular parts of that material stream. Yeah, I mean, I think when you state the fact that organic material makes up the majority of our waste stream, that sort of reframes the, the issue in a way that I think is important. Think, speaking maybe from personal experience, when you think about the recycling stream, you think of plastics for the most part, maybe maybe newspapers, maybe other things. But I think we get this image in our head of an, a, an ocean full of plastic, um, landfills, landfills full of plastic. But this notion of letting people know that, that there's this organic matter that we can use to nourish the soil is, is a complete sort of, I think, a way of empowering people. Because I think about uh, the lack of trust in recycling. You know, the, the Guardian recently did an investigation into the global the global recycling market and found that many of our 
materials end up in a landfill. China shut down, shut its doors to plastic recyclables in 2017. So there might be kind of a lack of trust in the system as it currently exists. You're, you're, you're sort of looking to change how people perceive recycling and, and you're working to change the paradigm. Talk a little bit about that. If, if you look at one of the very good examples that I can think of there in terms of, of, of say, the paradigm of recycling, if, if you look at some of the more remote areas of New South Wales where I live, there is a small town called Condoglin, which is five and a half hours west of Sydney. Now, they've never had a recycling program because people have always claimed that it's far too expensive to put that material into, into trucks and take it all the way back to Sydney and then put it on boats and take it all the way to China and turn it back into cardboard boxes and bring it all the way back to Condoble in this cardboard boxes. It just, it just doesn't make sense. And everything that comes into that town, because it's five and a half hours west of Sydney, everything that comes into that town is, is packed in cardboard boxes. So the result is if they don't have a recycling system, the, the cardboard boxes just end up going straight to the landfill. But if you think about what cardboard actually is, it's, it's fibre, it's, it's wood fibre. And if you look at at where their landfill is situated in that small country town of about two and a half thousand people, about 200 metres or 200 yards down the road from where their landfill is, they have their sewage treatment works and they've got these piles and piles of highly nitrogenous, uncontaminated sewage sludge that could be used in composting. So in the landfill, you've got carbon. In the sewage treatment works, you've got nitrogen. You combine those two things together and you can make a beautiful compost. And just on the other side of the sewage treatment works, is a wheat farmer of probably 5,000 acres who's probably got some of the lowest levels of soil organic matter in, the, in Australia. So it's about joining the dots and it's about understanding where that value can lie. And it's also, if you go back to your, your proposition about people um, being told that material is not being accepted in China or that material is being dumped in landfill, uh, people like Rupert Murdoch, the reason I got into, into publishing books before I was working for government a long time ago, I was publishing magazines on recycling. And the reason I got into that was because people like Rupert Murdoch owned both, uh, owned both paper mills and, um, and newspapers. So it was in his interest whenever he got too much newspaper to put stories into his publications that were telling people that the stuff was being dumped in landfill and so he could push the price up or down depending on on his need for additional paper so that there is quite rightly a huge amount of cynicism in terms of what's happening with recycling I, I think plastics is probably another fine example of that people are just constantly lied to about the material that's going to China if you look at what the Welsh people the people in Wales in the UK are doing with their recycling they source separate all their material so it's clean when it goes out into their cart, when it's put on the side of the road, and then it's sorted into trucks. So it's all clean, it's uncontaminated, you don't get any organic material mixed in with it. And because of that, because the stuff is a high quality product and it's clean and it's separated into the right category, it's still they have no trouble at all in selling that product. It's when we put material through materials recovery facilities and it's all mushed together and compacted together, and then it has to be all pulled apart. That's the sort of stuff that we're sending to the Chinese. And the Chinese are simply saying, we don't want your stuff anymore because it's trash. It's mixed up with organic material. It's mixed up with paper. The plastics are mixed up with tin. They have to run another entire separation process before they can use it. So it, in many ways, it's in, term, it's in terms of we need to look at how do we optimise the value for a community when we're actually recycling and reprocessing this material. We need to change our entire system so that we source separate everything into its different categories so we maintain maximum value at all times. Yeah, but for so long, single stream recycling was sort of considered the gold standard because it was convenient. Everybody could just throw their stuff into one container. It was, it was almost too good to be true. And in fact, I think as you're outlining, there are real problems there. Talk a little bit more about that and, and also maybe define at greater length the concept of source separation, which is a big part of your book. There are many, many examples around the world where materials recovery facilities where one element or another is taken out of the material stream. And some of those materials mixed recycling facilities work reasonably well. I would still maintain that if we get to a point of, of respecting, of having respect for the materials that we use on a daily basis, we will eventually get to the point where everything is source separated, simply because that's the best way to maintain value. In terms of recycling overall and in terms of source separation, the reason why we collected everything in a mixed 
bin or a mixed cart previously where it was all mashed together was for health issues. You know, in the 1950s and 60s, we hadn't thought much about value and it wasn't until a few sort of hippie type groups and alternate types started realising the value that was in paper and cardboard that it started to drive recycling in a different direction. But the whole, the, the focus in terms of actually getting true value out of those things is not truly realised until we first of all remove the organic fraction because that takes out the yuck factor. If you take the organic fraction, which is the cause of all the supposed health issues in, in waste stream recycling or waste stream reprocessing, you take the take the yuck factor out, the, the part that I think is of the most value, and put it in a separate container or put it in a compost pile in your backyard or, or put it into a community composting system or get it into agriculture. Once you've re removed that yuck factor, everything else is inert. Now, yes, 5% of probably or 10% of what's in that residual waste stream can be toxic material, but it's fundamentally inert. You could have, as they had in Guelph and Ontario in 1994, two separate bins. You'd have an organics bin and an inerts bin, and everything is basically separated. So you could potentially have a more successful materials recovery facility that took that sort of facility if, you'd had, if you didn't have the organic material in there in the first place. I'm curious, how much organic material are we leaving in landfills? Oh, look, it depends on what part of the world you're in, and it depends on what sort of degree of myth people believe in in terms of gas capture. But I would think if you look at the totality of the waste stream in any part of particularly Western society, you'd have to be looking at somewhere between 60 to 70% if you include paper and cardboard. That means when that material goes into a hole in the ground, it begins to generate methane, and, mo and most methane in what people are now calling bioreactors, which sounds really classy, which is just a means of supposedly collecting the methane gas off these systems. They interlay into different layers, pipes and operating those pipes with a slight vacuum, they draw the methane out of those piles, take the methane down to a heat exchanger, take the heat out of it, and then burn the gas. The problem with that is it, most of the places that you see, some of them will probably claim that they're collecting 90% of the methane. But even if you look at the fact that they're doing this intentionally, that means they're missing 10% of the methane. Well, methane's, I think, 30 times more dangerous than CO2 in the atmosphere and so the, the methane that gets pumped in the atmosphere for every, for every 90 tonnes you're collecting out of 100, you're pumping 10 tonnes worth 350 tonnes. It just doesn't work. The maths just don't work. It just makes so much more sense to get that organic material back into soil. Right. I mean, the, the externalities of our waste stream are significant, and you touch on that in the book. Talk a little bit about how environmentally destructive our current practices are. It depends whether you start with agriculture or you dispense with you, if you start with with resource loss. Either way, if you if you start with the agricultural proposition, I think it's the World Wildlife Fund and certainly the UN have been saying for the last few years now we've got about under the current industrial agriculture model we've got about we had about sixty harvests left before we degrade our soils to the point where we can't do what we're doing anymore. That's that's a really crucial sort of point. But also, too, at the same time, mining materials has become even harder. I can, I can fully imagine the circumstance where the plastics that we're producing are actually choking our entire ecological system. So there's a dire need on both that extraction proposition and on the reuse proposition in terms of agriculture to change what we're doing. There's the circumstances... Uh, simply we're going to kill ourselves because we can't produce enough food or we're going to kill ourselves because we've choked up all our waterways with plastic. You know, I'm curious. I mean, towns have taken to the idea of banning plastic shopping bags or at least taxing them. Meanwhile, every item in the grocery store is sealed within a plastic membrane that in many cases can or won't be recycled. And it seems like there's a big disconnect there. We can tax shoppers for plastic bags, but how do we reform the industries that are producing all of this waste? You're absolutely right. It's, it's a different proposition to the one, the picture we're painting to the public. We're, we're saying to the public, if you get rid of these plastic bags, the whole, whole thing will be sold. And the, and the same thing is true of container deposit legislation where here in Australia, we're, we're putting container deposit legislation onto certain bottles, which only the certain bottles that we're actually giving people money to return are only about 1.5% 
of the total waste stream. But we tell them in combination, if they ban plastic bags and they recycle these bottles, that everything is fine in the environment, which is just absolute errant nonsense. And, it, and on the other really weird extreme of that, if you look at plastic bags overall, they are probably one of the cheapest pieces of infrastructure we could use to gather up source-separated products. If you look at the township of Curitiba in Brazil, They've used plastic bags for ages to get people to bring their source-separated products or to bring their waste products and their organic products to a certain point for payment. And some years ago, and I think I mentioned it, yes, I do mention it in the book, there's a system developed by a gentleman called um, Richard Tong in New Zealand called Tagbag. And Tagbag was basically getting people to classify their products into four categories, organic material, non-recyclables, bottles and cans and paper. So they put their material into four four different plastic bags and they tied them up with a different coloured tag. And that gave you source separation at a phenomenal rate. It reduced the amount of material going from domestic sources to landfill by about 80%. So plastic bags, if they use the right way, say if you're in a, a poor community, a very good example would be Manila, where I think in 2011 they had a, a cyclone which hit them three times in one evening. And it killed 149 people, and those people were mainly drowned by plastic bags blocking drains. Now, that happens, of course, in mostly the poor areas where people people don't have very good housing and they're always susceptible to the worst damage overall in those situations. But basically, if those people were being paid, say, five pesos or 10 cents for every bag of source-separated material they bought, to a given point, including plastic bags, not only would it clean up the plastic bags, it would give the public, as they found in Curitiba, it gives the public a means of income. They can pay their way around transportation systems so they can get to work and they can buy themselves good food. So that also reduces the medical bills. So we have the tools necessary to make phenomenal change, but what we seem to be doing constantly is fiddling on the periphery. We'll talk a little bit about the economics of recycling. It's perversely set up to benefit certain companies and industries. Yes, it's quite illogical if people think about the investment they make in it. In, in if you look at in terms of collections here in the in the town where I live, next to our national capital, we pay probably four hundred dollars a year for collections and reprocessing of material. Uh, what value do we get from it, though? We don't get anything back from the sale of product because that usually goes to the collector or or we have a situation where if it goes to landfill it's all liability so i i think we'd be much better off if people could get their heads around the idea that the money they pay in rates should be like any other money they pay out it should be an investment and that investment warrants a return whether that's six percent or ten percent or three percent it warrants a return and in terms of the investment they've made, and that investment should be coming back to the community in terms of either employment or value. Why do we constantly pay big French organisations to come around with trucks and pick up our garbage and then charge us exorbitant amounts of money and then all of the profits are sent to shareholders in Paris? It, it just makes no logical sense. And in the process, we've given up on, on all the local people who could do that identical job for us because the French can do it cheaper because they're more competitive or something along those lines. Or the Australian companies, are, they're all the same. But we give money away to enormous organisations despite the fact that that money should be going back in and invested in the local community. Yeah, I mean, I think particularly here in, in the United States, we have kind of a fascination with technology and with things that seem like they're magic, you know, and, and I think that sort of applies to some extent to our waste system where you just roll the container out to the curb and it disappears. You don't have to worry about it anymore and you don't have to worry about the consequences anymore. Um, over the years, how, how have you engaged with people in changing their relationship with waste and getting them to take more ownership over their outputs. I, th- I think one of the one of the worst things I was involved in a long time ago was the collection system that we now use pretty well all over Australia, which is a yellow lidded 240 litre, so I think it's about a 60 gallon recycling bin, and that's a co-mingle bin. We did a research project when I first joined the Canberra government in 1992, where we had about 1.5 million dollars, which was an enormous amount of money, to find the best method of recycling. And when you think about recycling in those terms in those days, it was about the most efficient method of collecting. It wasn't about 
the best quality product we could produce. And so we spent our one point whatever millions of dollars and we came up with this yellow lidded wheel bin with a divider in it, paper in one side and the other containers in the in the other side. And it was actually taken up by an American firm called Browning Ferris Industries, BFI. They had, they had actually offered, and this gives you an idea of the value or otherwise of these things. I was doing the contractual arrangements at that time and for the people who were collecting our garbage there was a charge of 75 cents a lift browning ferris industries came in with a with a lift charge for a bin of 35 cents which was unheard of in terms of cheapness but what they gambled on was that they would ultimately have control over the sale of the product going out of their materials recovery facility well not long after they started the contract the, the bottom fell out of the market and I think they were, in the end, they were losing something like a million dollars a year. They lost about five to seven million dollars in the length of that contract, which is an insane thing. I mean, from a community's perspective, I was arguing as a, as a public, as a civil servant at the time, that we should have renegotiated that contract because it wasn't in the best interests of the community to have that big company suffering all that pain um, and, and commercial losses. But still, we sort of persisted with because that was what was in the contract and also too now that whole system has basically gone around the whole of the country so we've got this bizarre system and you've got it there too where you've got one contractor usually picks up the bins or the or the carts or recycling carts puts it into a truck and because they're not the same company that runs the materials recovery facility where it's destined to go that company the company that collects it increases the compaction on their truck so more and more material gets more and more heavily compacted together on the way around so the truck doesn't have to go back to empty so often they take the compressed what is now compressed muck to the materials recovery facility where they dump it on the ground and some glorious engineer has actually come up with this notion that they can sort all this stuff and and they'll have absolutely no waste left over which is drivel and nonsense most of the time they're contamination level the stuff that they send to landfills probably somewhere between five percent and twenty percent and so it's it's ineffective it's uneconomic and then what we do then is they they'll bail this stuff together and they'll try to send it to somewhere like china and again as you said earlier the chinese are saying we don't want it because it's trash so is it just it's a it's a spiral it's a, a run down to the bottom and it's a we all seem to be involved in this crazy race inefficiency and ineffectiveness and also, too, as I said before, we took out the organic material to start with. We'd have a completely different material stream to deal with in the in the longer term. So, since this is a podcast that focuses on farming, I want to talk about the connection between what we throw into landfills, and largely, and soil health and food production. We're sequestering or, or wasting valuable life-giving organic matter in landfill, or worse, we're burning it. And this is at the center of your work, particularly with the City to Soil project. Talk about the massive opportunity that we do have here and the methods that you've used to harness waste for good. Our entire focus to get people to give us clean organic material was to simply to say to them, we need this material clean because it's going into the soil to grow your food. And despite our cynicism in the world overall, no matter where we're positioned, we all have an investment in the future somewhere. You know, what? Um, some of us are going to end up in a home for the bewildered somewhere. So you'd hope the person looking after you is the same normal person. But we all have an investment in children. And, and people understood that simple message of saying, we need this product clean. Um, we found because of that simple message in the city to soil system, our contamination level if that education was continued, never went above half of 1%, which is extraordinarily low. So the idea for me has always been this concept of saying to people, the soil is your mother. Everything you ever are, everything you ever will be, depends on what sort of quality food you get to eat. So you need a relationship with the soil. Now, you can either grow that food in your own garden, you can grow that food in a community garden, or you can grow that food through an agricultural base in, in a farming community. Either way, that material has to be clean. You have to have this relationship with the soil. It's the most important thing in your life. It's the thing that sustains our economy. As I said before, regardless of how small the farming community is, they're fundamentally important. So if, if, farming, is, if farming is hitting hard times, if farming is is in a situation where its profit margins are dropping quite dramatically, then that's a great concern for us all. 
I think the idea with City to Soil, from my perspective, was simply to engage people in that conversation, to make them aware of the circumstances surrounding the soil in their local area, surrounding the soil with their local farmers, and to engage in that conversation in a more comprehensive way. Well, talk a little bit more about what that project uh, was what, and what it accomplished. Well, it's interesting to see how success in the waste industry or success in the recycling industry doesn't necessarily breed instant cooperation. We started the first example of the city to soil model here in this town where I live is Queenbian, which is quite unpronounceable for anybody else out of the area. But Queenbian just basically in the local Aboriginal dialect just meant the meeting of two rivers. But the idea in Queenbian was simply, so, as I said, source separation. It started here in 2003 and my local government here has still not instigated that program in this area. The, the difficulty quite often with trying to get these programs from one place to another is that the staff in local government areas, the staff in councils, the staff in state government are constantly training, are changing and people always feel the need when they come into an area to get rid of whatever anybody else has done and start their own new program. So quite often the actual tools that were used by the previous person to get a program up and running don't necessarily fit the, no the notion of what the, the next person wants to do. But simply put, the idea was to give people a small kitchen caddy of about six to eight litres capacity into which they put their food waste. We'd lined our bins on the kitchen caddies with um, compostable, fully compostable bags. And those, uh, because those bags breathe, because they release moisture all the time, they actually don't smell. So that you've got no smells in your kitchen. And if you tie up that bag and you put it in your green cart with any green waste that you're getting, that you want to get rid of out of your yard, you put that into that green bin. And again, you've got no smell in terms of collections. It went out to the side of the street where it was collected by, by a large truck and it was taken to a compost site. And that compost site, because of a compost style that we started to use, a method we used that was developed by Sir Albert Howard, we had no odour. So we had no odour in the house, no odour in the bin, no odour in the composting process. It just suddenly changed the whole focus of what the City to Soil program was about. It was about cleanliness and it's about soil and it's about food and it's about success because it's positive. A, a video we made at the time on the City to Soil program, which is in two parts on the net, is it just demonstrates that people thought it was an amazing success. But unfortunately, it wasn't necessarily liked by people in local government who came in and, and got rid of it and adopted something else. Was, was there public outcry over that? I mean, I imagine from what you're describing, that there was a fair amount of support in the community for that program. In some instances, there were. And in some instances, they just allowed the wheels to fall off slowly. One council in this area where I am here, they had a contract to actually deliver a product with no more than something like 2% or 3% contamination. And they just kept issuing more and more bins to more as the population grew in the local area. They kept issuing more and more bins with less and less education. And so the contamination level kept creeping up and up and up. And eventually the people who are doing the composting said we won't take the product anymore because it's simply not working. Education and engagement and keeping people excited, I mean, is fundamental to everything. I mean, we have people eating McDonald's so regularly all around the world. We have people drinking Coca-Cola. If you can get people to eat and drink that sort of crap, and not consider what it's doing to their bodies, you can sell them anything. So selling city to soil should have been relatively simple if it was actually put into a context where it, was, where it had real meaning for the local community. But quite often, the things that we're trying to do in those, in those areas aren't necessarily sort of um, supported 100% by the industry because I suppose you also to have to remember that the people in the waste industry and the people who work in environmental services in local government or state government essentially they all have the same qualifications so they're on the same career path you might work for a while in local government with your degree in environmental services and suddenly the, a big vacancy might come up in one of the large waste companies so you just go sideways and work in the private sector for a while and then when something else decent comes up in the public sector you just simply change streams again so because the waste industry and the local government industry are essentially the same animal. Nobody has any interest in change really happening because it's going to affect everybody's careers long term. So we need to go right back to tours and talk about what is it that we're talking about when we when we start to talk about 
recycling programs. We need to sign, we need to have a system that's designed for resource recovery and true waste minimisation, not a system that's designed to comply with the sorts of bins and trucks that the waste industry currently use. And do you think there's cynicism at play as well, um, that this idea that, well, people are not going to go to that much trouble? Absolutely. Absolutely, Ben. You're 100% right. Most people in local government, people in state government in this country, and I dare say people in federal government have only got to see the antics that are happening at a, at a federal and state level. People are very, very cynical about government. Um, people are very, very cynical about what their intent is and, and what direction they should be taking. I don't think, though, that that's a fair representation of the general individual's attitude. All of the state government people and federal government people I've ever worked with all believe that the average person in the street, the, the average householder is an absolute fool and idiot and they'll never, 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 ever do what you want them to do. And that's simply not true. We, we demonstrate with City to Soil that if you give people the right tools, the right motivation and the right information, they will do exactly what you want them to do. You know, to think about recycling is one thing. But to make the connection, as you have, to food production and agriculture is, is another way of framing it. And I'm curious, when did that insight occur to you? When did that become central to your mission? Um, when, we, when we first started the Sea to Soil program in this, in this small town that I'm in, we were fortunate in that um, there were a couple of people in the state government agencies who saw that it was actually quite a valuable project. And we, we were successful with a, a project that was $2 million worth. And we were involved with three local councils and the council in that town I mentioned before, Condoblin. And Condoblin is roughly five hours northwest of us, so it's a long drive. We very quickly realised that if we were collecting all of this organic material, so we're collecting the green waste from people's homes as well as their food, we very quickly realised that if we used a standard composting process of shredding everything up and then turning it every week and just the normal aerobic compost process, we would have been running up and down the highway with machinery. We would have used at $2 million in a matter of months. So we needed a new composting process. And we found that in a mixture of work that was done by Sir Albert Howard in Indore in India. In fact, if you look at pages 48 and 49 in a book he wrote called the Agricult An Agricultural Testament, you'll find a description pretty well of the compost process we used. But there was also another input into that was from a woman called May, uh, May Bruce. And May Bruce had come up with a composting, an enclosed composting system using herbage or herb, herbage as, a, as an inoculant mix. And it's a covered composting process, which was made generally in one cubic yard or two cubic yards. During the Second World War, she was producing enormous amounts of very, very high quality compost for people to grow vegetables. So we just combined those two systems. Now, as I said before, the, all of that information is available on my website. But effectively, we, we took all of our organic material that we collected in 240 litre carts. And keep in mind, most of the material that goes into those containers is so small, you don't get it. It's no bigger than your, no thicker than your thumb and no longer than your arm. So we didn't need to shred the product. So we wet it down to about 40%. We put our inoculant on it. We put a cover over the top. We put an indentation in the top. So when it starts to respire, the moisture drips back in. And then we found after you leave that sit for a little while, after about, about a week that the when the aerobes the aerobic material uh, bacteria have eaten everything they possibly can the ph drops to about 4.5 and the whole pile becomes facultative so it becomes fermentative so we could actually we had this process where we turned it once in the middle just to take out any additional contaminant but we had this composting process and in the same length of time that it did to other make other composting processes work we, um, we could produce a really high quality product with hardly any mechanical inputs. We think we'd cut the, cut the cost of composting by probably a third in terms of actually um, producing a high quality product. That's, and that's the sort of thing in a six week um, trip I did last June and July in the USA and Canada with Dr. Christine Jones. That's, that's the composting process and the inoculants that we were making for that was the sort of thing we were showing to farmers. So that's what drew me into that. Once you've got 200 or 100 cubic metres or 100 cubic yards of compost, you need markets for it. And so it was important. 
um, going by what we were saying about city to soil up front, that it's all about soil anyway, it was important that we actually use that product in agriculture. So as part of that trial, we actually ran a couple of trials with farmers at the same time. And that's where, for me, the connection led, came from and went to. In your travels around the globe, t- talk about some of the success stories you've seen. What stands out in your mind? Some of the really remarkable ones at a smaller scale, but with huge potential, I think probably the most interesting were China. Following that would be some of the people in the United States. You've got some remarkable farmers who are both open-ended and open-minded in terms of changing direction. But in China, China's a fascinating, fascinating place, but they have farmers over the years have become addicted to to chemical inputs. One particular group of potato farmers we work with near um, Jingkao in China, the, the problem that they had there was they were using polyethylene plastic sheets on top of their crops to keep the weeds down. They poked their tomato plants in through that. And at the end of the growing season, just before they took their crop off, they'd spray the whole thing for Irish blight with some amazing fungicide. Then they'd push all the paints and plastic down onto the end of their paddock or on the end of their property and out onto the public road in some instances, wait for it all to dry off and set fire to it. And of course, the government was already saying to them they couldn't keep doing that because there was already too much smoke in the air from power generation and vehicles and all that sort of thing. So the idea we came up with there was to use the composting process. If you look at potato plants, they're they I think they're unusual in that they've got sugars right from the leaf down into the potato. If you actually macerate that potato plant after you've, ta- after you've harvested the potato, you should be able to simply mix it with a bit of water, put some inoculant with it and turn it into a hydrolysate. So rather than having a waste, you've got a fertiliser you can put back on your land or even better still into your land. And there, we do have a couple of people doing that. We also too, some similar things happened with people in the, in the US and Canada. In the areas that we're in, just before we left, I was in Nebraska for a while and then we're up in North Dakota and then in Canada. And one of the interesting things about making the compost inoculant is that you need green plants to put into the mix because you need phototrophic and photosynthetic bacteria in it. And of course, in some of those areas, you only have 100 and something, 105, 110 day, frost-free days um, to grow a crop. And so if you wanted to use an inoculant and a compost, you need to start in the winter months and you need to start indoors. And, and some of the ingenious things we came up with there was instead of scraping around under the snow and trying to find a green plant, the best idea is simply go to the local supermarket and buy some broccoli or some other sort of brassica in a frozen form and use that directly into the mix to give you the phototrophic and photosynthetic plant. And so that meant we could actually have our composting process up and running when the farmer needed it before they put in their crops. The exciting thing for me about those conversations are everything I do is off the shoulders of someone else. Everything I've ever done is using other people's ideas. Certainly there's your own innovations that go into things. But if we can keep things open and free and not protected by intellectual property, we can do so much more for agriculture. Because if you go to farmers and give them a concept and say, look, this is what I did with it, see what you can do with it, they'll, they'll do remarkable things. So they are amazing people. If you give them some base skills to start with, they'll create miraculous effects out of what you thought was a relatively simple idea. That, that I think, is one of the most exciting things that I've seen repeated all around the world because I'm still talking to people in China, in France, in Taiwan, in, in America, in Canada, Still, people are coming up with extensions of ideas that I hadn't thought of with the things that I was doing. And they built their own functional models out of just a bit of information we gave them. That, that's the exciting thing, I think, Ben. What, what did you ho- hope to accomplish in writing this book, The Waste Between Our Ears? What audience are you hoping to reach? When, when we first started talking about the book, I was being reminded by marketing people all the time. I had to know exactly who, who the audience was. And I think the audience is everyone. I think the audience, the audience is Joe Public, really. The audience is really getting people to understand that we've made this dreadful mistake. I'm still in a few zero waste groups. I mean, I was one of the initiators of the Zero Waste International Alliance and also still in a group called the Zero Waste International Trust. And some of those zero waste groups have really, really taken off. 
I think the imperative behind all of those things is changing the way that we, that we think about these material streams, that waste is a dreadful concept. And, it's, and, and look, people will say to you, oh, the laws of thermodynamics will always tell you that you've got to have waste. No, you don't. You, everything has outputs, but the output, from, the output from a bird becomes manure that's a food for something else. Like I've reminded people quite often when we, when we the, the British or the extent population of the British arrived in this country 250 years ago, there was already a zero waste system in operation with the Australian Aboriginals. They didn't have trucks running all over the place picking up stuff. We just have to get used to the idea that these things have simple solutions just because we're living in mob densities doesn't mean that we can't use those same simple concepts of getting organic material back into soils and other resources back into manufacturing. It's just changing our mindset. It's changing our mind. So I, I, I love your approach of empowering people and trying to reach them in various ways to tell them that they have a role to play in using these materials for good. But I am curious if you were given, you know, universal powers and, and you could sort of mandate what sort of our waste flow or cycle looked like, what, what measures would you impose? What would you do away with? What would you implement with all that power? I think the principal thing would be getting, as I said before, all organic material back into a composting process or, or back into a situation where you could make a hydrolysate from it. So hydrolysate is basically just breaking the proteins in food waste back to amino acids and peptides and using it as an organic form of nitrogen. So that's one thing, just covering off on all of those organic processes. But I'd also look really seriously at the, the idea of when somebody's sent a whole lot of plastic into your area or send a whole lot of metal into your area, as I've got, has demonstra have demonstrated in the book, you can start small industries around those things. So I would have, with that degree of control, organics processing system that looked at everything from human waste to feral animals to collected organic waste made into products that could go back into soil safely and successfully, whether that's in soil food production or into soil in agroforestry, if a slightly contaminated material. But in terms of the actual glass and plastics and other materials, there's really no reason why that can't be manufactured. There's, there's a wonderful little Dutch organisation called Precious Plastics now that have an educational tool where they have a shredding process that you, in a 20-foot container, they've got a cleaning system, a shredding system, a, a remanufacturing system and a remoulding system where they can make plastic goods in a very small shipping container. It's not beyond the expectation that any community in any part of the world, particularly in Western society, could easily have a reprocessing system for their glass and plastics and metals and a good composting system for their organic. I don't know if you remember, I think it came out in the early 2000s, a book by William McDonough called Cradle to Cradle. Yes. And it was kind of about not necessarily changing consumer habits, but changing what people consume. In other words, you know, if people are now eating fast food out of containers and throwing it, you know, on the ground or, or wherever, like just make sure that that container is some kind of soil nutrient, you know. I mean, that was, that was sort of the premise of the book and it was co-written with a chemist, I believe. Are you familiar with that concept? I mean, is that something that you, you've thought about is, is sort of overhauling industrial packaging? and? Absolutely. If, if you look at that instance that I talked about before, about the cardboard in that township of Condoblin, the same thing is true. And perhaps not as true now because newspapers aren't as prevalent as they were. But if you, if you could get people to think that every time one of Rupert Murdoch's newspapers comes into your town, what yes, you've certainly paid money for the information or the misinformation that's in it but you've you've also acquired the value of that paper so what can you do with that paper in your own property or in your own community that then adds value to that i think mcdonald is quite right about that that it's changing the thought processes as much as changing our understanding of what the concept of waste is Again, going back to what he said, he's saying exactly the same thing that I was saying, I think, in many ways, because it's realising that the thing that you finished using at that particular time has an enormous amount of value. As I said, the, 
you know, nature has no waste. There's no such thing as waste in nature simply because the outputs of one thing become the inputs to another. And I think that's what McDonough was, try, was really trying to work on, the idea that we should start mimicking nature in a much more resonant way. Exactly, right. I'm kind of curious, and this is sort of an oddball question, I usually save those for the end, but I'm curious what you think of the whole kind of minimalist decluttering craze that is sort of sweeping, at least where I am in, in the U.S. Uh, Marie Kondo wrote a book. I, I'm blanking on the title, but the idea is that if you have some possession in your home that doesn't spark joy, you just get rid of it. And other people, you know, write books on minimalism and how they, they've learned to live with fewer things. And, you know, that sort of sparked the, the, these maybe sort of unintended consequences where places like Goodwill are overwhelmed with mountains of clothing that people yeah, no and, and the, want. And the same thing is happening here. And the difficult for, difficulty for people like Goodwill or here more St. Vincent de Paul is that they are, they are then compelled to sort of try to sort out the good bits from the bad bits and, the, and then they hang the, they hang the bad bits on a hanger in the shop and in some instances it's probably worth a similar value to what it was when, when it was purchased originally. I think there's all sorts of things about value there. The difficulty with what she's saying is that we don't have adequate systems to deal with the consequences of throwing everything away. But I mean, it's arguable as to why we had the why we had the bloody stuff in the first place. But um, still, it doesn't resolve the issue of of what you do with it when it's gone. One one of the points I keep making here, and it goes back Ben to agriculture once again, because if you look at China, you can buy a t-shirt in Australia for two or three dollars, or or even even though our dollar at the moment is worth half of your dollar, we can buy two t-shirts for eight dollars. The trouble with that is it's being, if it's been if that good has been manufactured in China, you had to feed a Chinese labourer to actually make that product. And that inherently means the Chinese soil is being degraded. There is an nth degree that we that we can get to with that sort of economy where if you as we talked about before, if the if the UN is saying that we've got sixty harvests left, then the Chinese are well down that route where they've where they've actually eaten their soil away to next to nothing. And you still need that the means of production is an individual, but you still need to feed that individual. You can see that our economic model has a very, very basic flaw because we're not protecting agriculture. The soil is the mother. Absolutely. The soil is your mother. Absolutely. Well, Jerry, I, I want to thank you for taking time to meet with us and, and talk uh, about your new book. Where can folks find out more information about the work you're doing? Best place for people to, to look in the short term is to go to the Acres USA website. There you go. In their new book section. If they want more information on, on me, generally it's jerrygillespie.net. There's a lot of information on my website in the news section and all, all of it, everything's for free. So, and I don't mean that, I mean, nothing's for free, I suppose, in the longer term. But the idea is that take those ideas and see what you can do with them. But Really, I think of all the things that I've done and all the places that I've led, I found myself in Nebraska talking to about 50 people in an audience and most of them were people whose names I recognised from Acres magazine. It was quite touching um, and moving in the sense that I think the implications for having reliable sources of information that tell us the truth about what we need to know about agriculture, soils, and our general production system is is so essential to everything that we do. And I guess I think it's a very, very important part of that, Ben. Well, I appreciate that. Jerry, thanks again for spending time with us today. Thank you, Ben. There you have it. Thanks again to Jerry for joining us. And thank you for listening to another episode of Tractor Time brought to you by Acres USA. Subscribe to our channel on YouTube, iTunes, or anywhere podcasts are available. Also find us on acresusa.com, ecofarmingdaily.com, and don't forget to subscribe to our monthly magazine. If you're interested in buying Jerry Gillespie's book, The Waste Between Our Ears, that is available at acresusa.com. Thanks for listening and have a great week.